All right. I think we can start. <coughs> Welcome back to this second lecture about this continuous galerkin. <laughs> so the plan today is the, is the following. Actually, we have also a session in the afternoon. I will introduce today a, <coughs> a second family of discontinuous Galerkin schemes that we call ADER, uh, which are differ with respect to Runge-Kutte that we have seen. <coughs> and so we, we will need to spend some time on them because they represent our um, core business in Trento. And we have done a lot of research in the last few years. Then there will be some attention to limiters as we emphasized on Tuesday. These continuous Galerkin methods are uh, linear schemes. So they will, they will oscillate at discontinuities if you don't do anything. And so we will, we will say something about limiters for discontinuous Galerkin. Then I will show some numerical tests to convince you that these methods are successful. And there is the tutorial session, which is very important, so I advertise it again here. But you certainly be <laughs> present, because we will go through a code, a simple code, that really uh, shows you this technology. There, there is not everything in the code, but it is uh, extracted from a much wider infrastructure. All right, so let's see this ADER approach. You remember the discontinuous Galeric and discretization that we have written? This is the prototype of it. There was this time, inter uh, time derivation here in the weak formulation. Then there is the surface integral, which involves, uh, you remember, the solution of the Riemann problem again. So this is something I stressed talking with people during these days, that discontinuous Galerkin methods also can involve Riemann solvers, and here they do, because there is a surf surface integral. And then here there is this volume integral. Now we use this uh, expansion over our basis of your preferred choice, typically polynomials. And we integrate in time, no? We integrate in time immediately. We get this discretization, if you wish, in which here, because there is this, this expansion with respect to the index L, you see here, there is a time marching from time level n to n plus 1. In front of it, there is this matrix, which is called the, the mass matrix. And then you, you, you have the time integration, uh, uh, as usual, at the two terms. Now, the question is this. Is it possible to implement this as it is, as a high-order numerical scheme, avoiding runge kutta altogether, but preserving, of course, high-order high vacuums in space and time? So this is the question. Huh? And the answer is yes. And so we enter into the Eder philosophy. So at the end, in a, at the end of this section, we will see that this is exactly the scheme that we implement in the code. And it, it will be a single step in time. So there are two versions of ADER, an original one, which dates back to 2001. And then there is a more recent one that is one we will see in the code and is actually what we currently use in, in our simulations because it's more flexible. But it's worth paying attention also to the original because it contains the main idea, the original version. OK, so ADER is this acronym, Arbitrary Derivative in Space and Time Numerical Schemes, and it contains a few ingredients. It defines a generalized Riemann problem at the interface between cells. What is a generalized Riemann problem? It's a Riemann problem with constants, sorry, with initial states which are no longer the constants but they are the polynomials. So you see here, on the left and on the right, there is not a constant, but there is a pjx polynomial. Is the discontinuous, is the, is the polynomial on the, on the cell j, and on the right, there is another polynomial. So this Riemann problem is quite different from what we are used to. And solving, is, solving this exactly is virtually impossible. It's not an academic exercise. You could even set up an experiment for this. In, in general, it will produce a quite different wave pattern. Characteristics will be no longer straight lines, will be curved lines. Uh, the Riemann solution itself will be no longer self-similar as, as a Riemann solver is. 
and other properties. For example, uh, uh, rarefaction will be no longer isentropic. I mean, there are a number of features which make this much more complex. So, in general, we cannot find the exact solution of this um, generalized Riemann problem. And so, you what you do is an expansion, a tailored expansion in time at the interface of your ages and cells. And so, now you look at what is happening here. I'm expanding in time with respect to this T prime coordinate, right? This is the leading term at time t equals zero plus an expansion with time derivatives. So the leading term is computed by solving a standard Riemann problem with constant left and right states, okay, which are the boundary extrapolated values of the polynomial. So this term here comes from the solution of a normal, let's, let's call it standard Riemann problem. And we know how to do that. But now here comes the problem. There are these time derivatives. We, we don't like them much. So we apply this cauchy kovaleski procedure, which is standard in the studies of PDEs. We replace time derivatives resorting to the original PDEs that we have. So the first time derivative will be just minus df of the u, the Jacobian, dx u, right? So you have, then you have mixed derivative like this, and you just do some algebra. And everywhere, so you see here, I've written a time derivative in terms of spatial derivative. Then you reach second derivative in, in time and you do something similar. And everywhere you see a time derivative, you go up and replace with the corresponding expression. So any time derivative can be written in this form and then replaced into the Taylor expansion. Now, of course, you tell me, well, yes, but how do you compute spatial derivatives? Exactly. Then you have to do something more. You can now solve a sequence for the computation of these spatial derivatives on the right-hand side. You solve a sequence of linear Riemann problems for the spatial derivatives. So here you see there is a dt of a generic k derivative in space for the u at the interface, advected a tilde is a constant, is the matrix of the original PDE computed in the leading state coming from the solution of the standard Riemann problem, and then dx advected the same quantity here, the same spatial derivative. All right, this is the idea. Uh, we know how to solve uh, linear Riemann problems. They are just superpositions of, of linear waves. No? As, you have to think about the linear advection equation. This is a system, so you have superposition of linear waves. Uh, <clears throat> and A tilde is a constant, in fact, is a linear system. So with this, uh, all this machinery, I remind you there is a standard Riemann problem to solve, and then a sequence of M. M is the degree of the polynomial. We are expanding, look at here, we are, we are expanding up to a given degree. Uh, a sequence of M such linear Riemann problems. Right, and these linear problems uh, uh, have also constant left and right states, which are given by their uh, analytic spatial derivatives of the polynomial, and we know how to compute derivatives. <clears throat> so the result is the following. If you can do this, you will have at the end a time evolution of uh, uh, a generalized uh, Riemann solver, sorry, Riemann problem, that you can use now in this scheme. And you can generate uh, a high order one step numerical scheme because that U will be used here for the comp This is actually the Riemann problem because here there is a flux. And here it's, it's even simpler because uh, it's a volume integral. You just have to make a Taylor expansion in time. For this, there are not even Riemann problems to solve because there are no discontinuities here. You are inside the cell. <clears throat> this uh, procedure, which looks uh, elegant, is unfortunately very cumbersome to implement when you go to higher and higher complex PDE systems. And for example, it has been implemented for um, for the Euler equations, gas dynamics, 
but as soon as you introduce magnetic fields or if you even go to a relativistic regi regime, it's virtually impossible because you can imagine how complex, sorry, how complex this equation can become, especially if you have sources in your PDAs, right? So this original version of ADER, which has a, for a few years attracted a lot of attention and still used actually, uh, has this defect that cannot be extended to very complex systems. So there is an alternative uh, ADER, which I describe uh, now and will also be present in the numerical code this afternoon. So this is the version we will use. <coughs> so we need an alternative to this uh, Taylor expansion in time. And this is uh, based on the idea of performing locally for each cell, a, so irrespective of what happens in neighboring cells, a, a time evolution of the DG polynomial. So we start with the DG polynomial, which I denote with UH, and I need a, a time level TN, you see. I need a recipe bit to generate a time evolution locally just for that cell. This will not be the true solution because I have, it's just local for that cell, but it will be called a predictor solution. That's why this is called the local space-time discontinuous Galerkin predictor. So let's see how we can do this. It, this will be based on the, again, on the weak formulation of the PDE. So the SOT polynomial, it will be again be a polynomial, this time evolution of U, is expanded over a space-time basis. Okay, so it's not only a space basis, there is also the time basis. So here QH is expanded equal theta P, Xi tau, you see Xi is a space, is a reference coordinate, and then there is also time here. And then there are a number of degrees of freedom. So how many of them? You remember from, la from Tuesday there are m plus one coefficients, so degrees of freedom for any spatial direction. Here, if you are in 3D plus time, we have m plus one to the four such numbers. These ones, right? The polynomial basis will be, for us, uh, also in the code that we sh will see, will be the nodal basis that we have described, and this will be given by the tensor product. So this space-time basis function is just a tensor product of the one-dimensional basis function, all right? So there is no distinction for me between space and time, after all. This P, therefore, is a multi-index, all right? It's not a, a unique index. Now we rephrase this PDE in terms of the reference coordinates, which is necessary, it's a standard way. So here you see I introduced this F star, which drags in the Jacobian of the transformation between reference and physical coordinates. All right, notice that I have also the sources on the right hand side because we want to solve complex systems. And then <coughs> I multiply the governing PDE by the test function, as usual in the, in the Galerkin formulation, right? So I multiply this, uh, everything is on the left-hand side, you have see here. I have highlighted the three directions because I want to show you the complexity of the strategy. And then I integrate over the space-time control volume, so in space and in time. So there are three integrals for space from zero to one, and then there is one integral for time. Now the aspect here, the key aspect is to perform a integration by parts in time, not in space. We, can, we want to remain local in space, just for that single cell. All right, so when you integrate by parts in time, from the first term here, you see, uh, we generate t theta q and then u. I replace u by notation qh because it's my sort uh, evolution polynomial, no? U is essentially my unknown, of course, is the conserved quantity. Now QH is what I'm looking for, is the evolution of this U. So this will be computed at one, one, because this is the, uh, the right-hand side integration, so at time T equal one is the future time. And uh, there is, his, his brother is on the right-hand side, at time T equals zero, you see here, the same term, but at time T equals zero. And what is the polynomial at time t equals zero? Is the original discontinuous Galerkin polynomial for that cell, all right, that we know because it's at the time level tn. 
So here there is this expansion. Then, because of integration by parts, there is minus integral time derivative of the basis function, which we know how to compute, QH, our unknown, plus the rest is unchanged. Essentially, there is a space-time integration of the term here with the fluxes and the sources on the right-hand side. All right, looks like mm, complex, but let's see. There are a number of terms that we need to make explicit, for example, these fluxes. But please, you don't need a Riemann solver for computing those fluxes because we are inside the cell. This is a volume integral. So the fluxes can just be expanded over the same basis and even the sources as we do for the unknown solution. So half star is an expansion here. There is the summation convention. I'm not writing the summation symbol. And so this is, this is what can be done. And what are the degrees of freedom of such f hat, which are the degrees of freedom. They're just the physical fluxes computed in the sort solution, in the nodal points, right? Because there is no Riemann solver to, to do, it's just the physical flux there. So f hat star is the physical flux computed in the q hat, which is the degree of freedom of the unknown solution. You do the same for the others and for the sources, quite the same stra strategy. Now, please, now we replace uh, all these expressions into the previous equation. If you go just up again here, where you, uh, wherever you see QH, QH, F star, S star, you expand and you get this formulation. So for example, here you see there is just a multiplication of basis functions at time level T1. And here these are numbers, are coefficients. They can move out of the integral. Minus another integral time derivative, we know how to compute them. All right. And here there are these degrees of freedom of the fluxes that we have specified, just specified. So we can even make this formulation more compact and introduce a matrix notation because you see the, there is a, a matrix here, right? So for example, we introduce these integrals, sorry, these notations, K1 is the space integral of the basis functions at level one minus space-time integrals. And here you have just to compute this. You compute once forever at, at the beginning in your code. This is not time-dependent computation. Uh, each of these matrix has a name, a mass matrix, stiffness matrix. You may, uh, you may be familiar with this or not. So therefore, the, the, the equation in the previous slide, this one, can be rephrased in this more compact matrix notation like this. Right, in which the unknowns are the degrees of freedom of the solution, namely the polynomial evolving in time locally in that cell. So this is an algebraic system to be solved with some iteration procedure. It's a time-consuming part of the code, although not the most time-consuming. <coughs> and it, it can be solved, with, for example, through a Picard iteration. So let me see. Um, a lot of differences uh, enters the game depending on the sources because they might be stiff or not. All right, yesterday we had a brilliant example of stiff uh, sources for radiation aerodynamics. And so, for example, that will require special at attention. So there are these two cases. For non-stiff sources, we solve this uh, system explicitly in the, in the source terms. I plus one is uh, the iteration index of the Picard, all right, is not any other index. The, Q, the P is the multi-index of the degree of freedom. I plus one is just the, the, P, the index, uh, iteration index. So here there is a matrix inversion because uh, from the previous slide you see there is K1 is a matrix which multiplies all the rest from the right-hand side and the sources are there, normal sources, however. Mm? As soon as they become stiff, you will have to move the sources to the left and treat them implicitly in your Picard iteration, otherwise you, you will fail. <coughs> there is a, so the, the convergence of this is, a, there is a nice mathematical property is under certain conditions is guaranteed by Banach theorem, no? the, uh, the fixed point iteration theorem. <coughs> 
And in fact, uh, now I will comment, uh, in a f essentially it's very efficient. Uh, in, in for non-stiff cases, it will converge in two, three iterations. For stiff cases, some, something more, five, six iterations. So if you can solve this, <coughs> you will compute any of these space-time degrees of freedom, and therefore you will have your SOT polynomial but this is not yet the solution. It's just a predictor of the solution local for that cell from time level zero to, sorry, Tn, Tn plus one. So how now, what do we do with this predictor solution? We correct, there is a corrector step. We go, we go back to the original di discontinuous Galeric and discretization. You remember? Here, uh, I wrote this, uh, uh, margin in time difference. And now here there is the flux to compute. Here we apply now the Riemann solver. So we couple the cell. We have computed a predictor for any of those. And now we can solve FRPs, the Riemann problem. So this, why, this will come from your preferred choice of Riemann solvers. With the left and right states that are given by the boundary extrapolated values of the predictor polynomials. And you have one of those for any Gaussian point in time, because here there is a time integration to perform. So you, you will use a Gaussian quadrature and you must evaluate your polynomial at any time. And you have it because you have solved this predictor step. The volume integral is also there and it will also use the predictor because there is this F here does not require any Riemann solver. It's just the physical flux computed in the required points. Okay, when, when, when we see this in practice in the code, we, we become much more clear. But, right. As I, as I said, the, for the Riemann problem, you can choose whatever you want, something very complex or in, involving eigenvectors like row type, Osher, Flux, Riemann solvers, or something simpler like HLL, right. So let me, this is the, the idea of this either discontinuous Galerkin based on the local space time discontinuous Galerkin predictor. And let me make a couple of comments. <coughs> so note, I repeat it again, but I think it's important. In the predictor step, there is no Riemann solver implied. Uh, we would be disappointed to see a Riemann solver there because typically it's also something that can become complex. The effective order of accuracy of the scheme is, as I stress already, is di just dictated by the degree of the polynomial. So it will be n plus one, both in space and in time, for free, let's say. But not completely for free, but you don't need to do, to change your algorithm for changing the order. The stiffness of the sources is naturally accounted for. Why is that? No, because we have seen the stiffness is uh, addressed by using a locally implicit algorithm. So the logic is not so far from IMAX. It's much different from splitting. No, in splitting, you cannot really solve strong stiffness problems. <coughs> so I will show you an example of such systems. And the convergence of predi the predictor is also important. The Picard iteration, uh, as, as I said, it is quite efficient. It converges <coughs> in three steps, typically for the gas dynamic Euler equations, which are non-linear. Eh? For stiff problems, it requires some more, but still. And uh, there's, there are also comparisons between Eder and ruge -Kutte, because you may say, well, I don't like it. I want to do ruge -Kutte. I like it much more. <coughs> so in this reference here, a comparison has been performed, and Eder is almost a factor two faster eh, than ruge -Kutte, but for non-stiff cases. There is no systematic comparison for stiff sources. I, I honestly don't know. I should, I should try myself. <clears throat> In any case, this, uh, uh, this scheme that we have proposed over the years is very promising and successful. And again, because there are no substages of the Runge Kutta, reduced MPI communications will be there. The approach can be also extended to finite volume schemes. No, we are talking about Ader discontinuous Galerkin. But we can do essentially the same, but for Ader finite volume, just go up here 
and put constant one to the test function. So it will become a finite volume scheme, right? Here there is a, a is an orthogonal matrix. It's one, one, zero, because there is, this is a constant. So this will be the finite volume scheme. And still you can use the same technology. The only difference is that the initial conditions of the local predictor will not be the discontinuous Galerkin polynomial, but the finite volume polynomial that, re that you reconstruct starting from cell averages. I, I repeat, <laughs> let's go back here. You remember at the beginning, I said, let's perform time integration. On the left hand side, there is uh, the unknown quantity at time level T1. On the right hand side, there is uh, our quantity at time level T equals zero. And what is that for the discontinuous Galerkin case? is the discontinuous Galerkin polynomial. For the finite volume case, this will be our DVD limiter, we know reconstructor polynomial, whatever you have chosen, right? So this uh, local space and discontinuous Galerkin approach can be applied for both cases. <coughs> All right. Uh, because it's such a crucial step here, I suggest if you have any question about this aspect, you may ask right now, or later, of course, if you wish, but it has a, a number of features, and people, first time they see it, usually. Yes? When you do solve the Riemann problem, is it a general Riemann problem? No, it's a standard Riemann problem. Yeah, yeah, that would, uh, that would be, overwhelming complicated. Uh, and we don't need it because uh, the generalizing man problem solves the time evolution with the Taylor expansion. Here, the time evolution is done through this uh, uh, solver here, right? Because there will be a degree of freedom for any Gaussian point in time also, right? So you don't need to do that generalizing and so on. Okay. Yes, yes. Yes, certainly, because uh, it's still based on the conservative formulation. The, the old equations are still, uh, the weak formulation refers to the fact that you have to, to uh, add the discontinuity to consider just a weak solution, but you're not violating conservation. Uh, your uh, question now comes, becomes more relevant for uh, non-conservative systems. So we, we'll go now to them. All right. If you don't have any other questions, we okay. Yes. So if the search terms are non-local, then this becomes a global iterative problem. Sorry, I missed you. What if the search terms are non-local? Does this become a global iterative problem? Oh, they are not global. You mean? Uh, the, the, source, the source terms are not local. Not local. Yeah. For example. Radiation. Mm, so you, when you have an integral because you have an integral on the right-hand side for the sources. Yes. Okay, I haven't thought about them in detail, but I think... Uh, okay, good question. Maybe <clears throat> because this approach is local for the cell, you must do like that. Uh, I think you have to choose an approximation to your sources locally there. Anyway, we can, we can think about it. So, uh, right. An example of the stiffness problem is well known to you by now. You have read already in more than one occasion during these weeks. And it's relative, resistive relativistic MHD, right? So, spatial relativity or general relativity with magnetic fields, but resistivity. The linguist number is no longer mm, a huge quantity. This is, is relevant in several places. Of course, peak codes have an advantage, but still you can do, extract some, some physics also from MHD simulations. And this can be very important when you have reconnection problems. So in this case, uh, the equations to solve are, uh, I'm, I'm writing in the special relativistic case, uh, the five equations for the momentum, for, sorry, for the fluid. So the first three here. 
then the evolution of the electric field, Maxwell equations with the currents on the right hand side, induction equation for the magnetic field. Then I have two, these two extra scalar quantity because I'm, I am assuming divergence cleaning, but something better can be done, you know, right? For uh, treating the monopole, the divergence free condition of the magnetic field and the conservation of charges. So in principle, these two equations shouldn't be there. Then the charge conservation equation. And here you have your quantities. You may be already familiar with them. I'm using the same notation by Charles yesterday. He had gamma, big gamma for the Lorentz vector. Okay, but apart from this, we know that the currents, J, are dictated by Ohm law. And so when sigma, the electric conductivity, goes to infinity, so in the ideal MHD limit, this equation becomes stiff. It's an interesting feature. <coughs> so when sigma diverges, ideal MHD limit, you have potentially this, you have these stiff sources. So here, in our local space-time discontinuous Galerkin predictor, as I said, we must, in these cases, consider the source terms implicitly. So we move them on the left, and side, they are no longer on the right. I plus one is the iteration of the index of the Picard iteration. And what do I do for the sources? Now I typically consider this expansion. So I'm expanding with respect to the iteration index, right? Sorry, yes, uh, I'm writing like this, plus ds over u with respect to the conserved quantities. And then here the implicit term will go over the unknown quantities. So we'll, be, we'll, we'll remain on the left hand, hand side, while the other will go to the right. And you can solve uh, in this way the stiffness of the equations. This is uh, the example I'm reporting. It's very simple. I don't, I don't want to show much about it, but it's the rotor problem for MHD. There is a rotating structure with a, we, within a given radius. It has a spin frequency. Density is higher inside, smaller outside. There is a uniform magnetic field along the x direction. So the ideal MHD code, the truly ideal MHD code without uh, evolving the electric field gives this solution. Pressure here on the left, electric field along z direction on the right, okay? So this is the result from the ideal MHD code. This is the result from the resistive code in the stiff limit, sigma 10 to the five. It's not a huge number, but still is. And the results are very similar to the ideal MHD one. Um, then if you decrease sigma quite a lot, you will have different, of course, behavior because of the resistive effects. So you can't do this with a splitting. You can do this with IMAX, right, just to make a a comment. All right. <clears throat> now, because talking with some of you during these days, I've noticed some interest with respect to non-conservative products. It was not actually my intention to talk about them, but because I've noticed some interest, I will spend a couple of lights, slides. Because numerical schemes for cases like this, in which you have a term of this kind, can be are different. No? as I stressed on Tuesday. And there is in particular a class of numerical schemes which are called path conservative methods, which are quite successful. The problem is when you form shocks, because as long as you remain smooth, all right, we know how to solve this. But when you have discontinuities forming, then, uh, and you cannot really in integrate computer flux, corresponding flux, because you don't know from your physics how to do that, then it may be a trouble. Um, example only, uh, you know already from last week for the Einstein equations, we can write them in conservative, in uh, quasi-linear non-conservative formulation like this, but fortunately enough, they do not produce shocks, right? You, you stressed spent some time on this. So the Einstein equations have this nice feature at least. <clears throat> so 
So in that case, we don't even need this technology. But let's, there are some other cases, like uh, uh, two fluid, uh, two, sorry, two, two fluid uh, uh, systems, which, uh, uh, for example, all gas uh, combustion like that, they can be written in this form, and they will form these continuities. So the theory behind this is being developed quite a long time ago. You can see if you are, if you have mathematical interest, you can go there. <coughs> and here, the idea is that the jump across the discontinuity depends on the path that you choose to integrate from the left and the right of across the discontinuity. Okay, this is not much physical if you want, and that's why this uh, technology has received some uh, ostracism, I would say, for some time. But it's so successful, it compares so much well, even with experiments, that now it's difficult to reject it just on mathematical arguments. So we introduce a, a path, C, big C, which connects uh, depending on a parameter s from 0 to 1, which connects when, C, when s is 0, sorry, ul, to ur when s is 1. is a path through the discontinuity. It has other mathematical features. We don't need to comment on them. You just read it. It's a Lipschitz continuous function. It has a number of properties. And now you generalize the renkine ugonio condition that we know for uh, conservative systems we generalize to this new ex expression, sigma, the, spe the speed of the discontinuity times the jump in the conserved variables is equal to, for conservative systems, it was just the jump in the fluxes. Now it's an integral of A, our starting matrix, deep C over the S, derivative along the path integrating in S. <coughs> and U is actually a weak solution of, ne of the non-conservative PDE uh, in the smooth uh, region of the flow, it will be just like uh, a normal solution. While in across discontinuities, it will be a weak solution only if it satisfies this relation. You can check yourself that for conservative systems, you recover the standard Rankine Grignard condition, which is good. And now you have the choice of the path. Of course, here you can do simple stuff or more complex. More complex means computing. Riemann invariance and selecting the path along Riemann invariance in phase space. We don't want to do that. So we just choose a straight line connecting the two states on the left and the right of this continuity. This may seem oversimplified, but it works even for MHD and other systems. <coughs> no, sorry, not MHD because it's conservative, of course, but for, for a case that I will show you in a while. When you do this, you have two versions. Now we are talking about finite volume, discontinuous galerkin, right? So there will be a finite volume version of this path conservative scheme, and there will be a discontinuous galerkin for path conservative schemes. So just to show it to you, the finite volume version, you are updating in time cell averages. There is the conservative contribution, as usual, has not changed, plus, this one, which is new and is related to the non-conservative terms. Note that there is a plus here, it's not a typo, it's a true plus. And the jump contribution involves this integral in time. Well, the integral in time is obvious, it, it comes from the finite volume integration. But the term D1 is this path integral, which involves the, this, the, the choice of the path. So is this integral here in the parameter S, of your matrix AM, your, the matrix from your PDE, eh, computed uh, in, through the path times the jump. If there is no jump, because maybe not any discontinuity, this term 48 will completely vanish, right? No jump, no term. This will not be there. You will only have the terms from P, which takes part of the smooth contribution of the non-conservative -term terms. This one, for example, for the Einstein equations will always be there, right? And you will not earn any time from this. <coughs> I have, you see that I'm using QH. 
Mm? Because I'm using the predictor. <coughs> this path conservative idea can be incorporated into the local space time predictor. That is why here you see Q rather than U. Because whenever there is a time integration, I need the time evolution of the polynomials. And then there is the discontinuous Galeric inversion of this path conservative. So the time evolution of the conserved quantity, here there is the uh, mass matrix, uh, is obtained through this scheme in which you recognize uh, the conservative terms, solution of the Riemann problem, plus the gain, uh, the non-conservative non jumps, computed just like as in the previous slide. And here there is minus volume integral plus smooth parts of the non-conservative terms and then the sources, if you have any. <clears throat> All right, so this is a quite a different class of numerical schemes and I wanted to spend a bit of time on it because they may be relevant for some of you. An example <clears throat> is this, a uh, two-phase flow is derived from uh, <coughs> deflagration to de detonation transition theory. So, for example, it's using uh, uh, gas oil uh, transport, very practical cases. And you can do even, solve e even uh, shock tube problems for these equations. There is typically a gas and a solid, right? So I'm reporting P solid, P gas, just one case. I don't want to bother you much. There is a reference solution available. And here, these are true discontinuities. I mean, okay, now there are some oscillations that we comment. It's not totally perfect. But the majority of numerical schemes here fail catastrophically. They can't solve such discontinuities. All right. Uh, do you see a difference here? The notation either prim, either cons. We'll come back to this later, now because uh, it's a subtlety, but it's important. We are evolving in time the conserved variables, of course. It's a conservative numerical schemes. But uh, the local space-time predictor can be implemented also for the primitive variables, rather than for the conservative. There are some advantages when you do that. And so, for example, in this case, the either primitive formulation performs better than either conservative formulation in which you, you perform the local space and predictor on the conserved variable. But I will go back to this. <clears throat> Actually, it's something well known in the literature. No? In a finite volume scheme, when you do reconstruction, you have a, a number of choices. You can reconstruct primitive variables, conservative variables, or characteristic variables. Reconstruction in the characteristic variables is regarded as, as the best one, but is, is more involved because, because you need uh, uh, eigenvectors. The construction of the conserved variables in the conserved variables in the standard final volume scheme is regarded as the worst one. Yeah? So, and here I am proposing such conservative reconstruction. But later I will show you a, another approach in <coughs> for the primitive variables. All right. <coughs> and now we need to go to the limiters because as we said, <coughs> Um, these continuous Galeric schemes, according to Godinov theorem, are linear schemes. How do you convince yourself? You just take the linear deduction equation, take the discontinuous Galeric and discretization for the linear deduction equation, and you will extract a linear scheme. Right? Godinov theorem has been proved for linear systems. So, uh, <clears throat> if I solve uh, a standard shock tube problem for gas dynamics with a finite volume scheme, I think this is, okay, I don't remember the name of this problem because I changed parameters a bit. I get this solution. There is a rarefaction wave to the left, standard, uh, and then there is a shock to the right here, contact discontinuity. There is even AMR. This is look nice. I think this was second order, very low calculation, low order calculation. If I apply the pure DG scheme, as just like as I showed this morning, with the local space and predictor, as it is, that's why I call it pure, pure. <laughs> then I'm very disappointed. I see the, these oscillations, post-shock oscillations, even AMR activated where it was needed. So it's a failure. Uh, 
it's a disaster. <laughs> and it's a simple shock to your problem. Right? Of course, the problem is well known, and uh, there are way out of it, ways out of it. I cannot make a, an exhaustive review of the, all the strategies that have been proposed to address this issue. I will just mention a couple of them, and then I will, uh, I will explain to you what we have developed in Trento. So a possibility is to introduce artificial viscosity, right? And this, okay, I have reported just one reference, but there are many others. Another possibility is to introduce spectral filtering. You want to kill the modes that are, the degrees of freedom that are oscillating, producing the problem. So in the expansion here of the solution, I can introduce a sigma. It's my filter. Depends on K of the expansion. Normalized to the order, the degree of the polynomial. And for example, you, know, you can have an exponential filter. Mu is the strength of the, of the filter. It's called like that. Delta T over delta X. This is a one-dimensional case. And to a power of P. E to a power of P. P is the, even the order of the filter, not the filter as an order. <laughs> All right. So you can do like this. It's successful. You can solve the problem of the previous slide. And it works. Or you can isolate the trouble cells and apply any kind of nonlinear limiting that you are used to from finite volume schemes. Right? You have the problem is you have to uh, select the cells that have a problem almost a priori. For, the, for example, when you see a strong compression, divergence of pressure, negative, you say, oh, here I will have a problem. problem sorry. Uh, so you will isolate that cell and you will try to do something to limit the cell. Uh, here the, you can find uh, a lot of uh, uh, information. But many of these limiters dissipate much of the information contained in the DG polynomial. No? Because the, the DG polynomial is a polynomial. So it, it has a sort of subgrid information. If you throw it away because your limiter is activated where it was not needed or any other reason, you are losing accuracy and information. All right, so there is an alternative to this, which is to use an a posteriori limiter. And now we will see how it works. It works for any system of PDEs. You don't have to make any ad hoc uh, uh, reasoning. <clears throat> so this brings us into this ADAR discontinuous Galerkin plus subcell limiter. It's an a posteriori strategy in, this, in the following sense. We first compute the pure DG solution, as I just explained in the first uh, half an hour of this lecture. So on the main grid, which is this, the big cell, where the DG polynomial is living, I solve uh, with the ADAR DG. Then, if problems are detected, and I will show you how they can be detected, then I will mark that cell as uh, troubled, and I will generate a subgrid with a number of subcells along each direction. How many? Because the DG polynomial has n plus 1 degrees of freedom, I need at least n plus 1 subcells along x, along y, along z. All right, at least n plus one subcells on the subgrid. And I will go back to the previous time step when the discontinuous Galerkin polynomial was still safe, and I will project data as cell averages on the subgrid. Let's see how it works. I need this projector operator because I want to go from the big grid, the main grid of the DG polynomial, to the subgrid where cell averages are defined. So this uh, projection from U to V, V are just cell averages, all right, on the subgrid, is uh, 
doing by simple L2 projection, which means that I have to compute uh, these integrals over each of the subcells of the subgrid. So cell I has produced a subgrid, and there is a J cell. Oh, in, there are the, the J indexes for the subcells. <clears throat> and then I need also a reconstruction operator because I will do something on the subgrid with these cell averages, but then I want to recover this continuous Galerkin polynomial on the main grid. So I need a reconstruction operator which recovers U, the DG polynomial, on the main grid from the cell averages on the subgrid. And this will be imposed by this integral conservation. When you integrated the discontinuous Galerkin polynomial that you don't know yet, over each of the subgrid, you recover the cell average, which you know. This is a, can be actually easy, an overdetermined system. So you need a least squares approach, right? A least squares approach with a constraint that on the big grid, on the larger one, the starting grid, sorry, so, yes, the starting cell, the integral of the discontinuous Galerkin polynomial is just the summation because this is a summation of cell averages. And the two operations commute in the following sense. Now you can perform a <coughs> the reconstruction of a projection is the identity. It's important that the information that you have on the main grid with the discontinuous Galerkin polynomial is as much as it is on the subgrid through the cell averages. You are not throwing away information. So pictorially, which is maybe simpler, this is the discontinuous Galerkin on the, on the main cell, and it is projected. And the blue, uh, sorry, and the, yes, the blue cell averages are the subgrid cell averages. <clears throat> and you, can, you must be able to go from left to right and from right to the left. So remember, in the notation, VH denotes a set of cell averages, so just constant values. So now I need a detection criterion, right, when to, to, to say when this is failing. Because I start from my DG polynomial, I apply the scheme, and I get a candidate solution. Is this a good solution? You have to do this uh, systematically, automatically. You don't want to specify for any different system of PDEs, if it's okay or not. You need a general rule. So you have physical detection criteria and a mathematical criterion, which is the discrete maximum principle. So physically we know, depending on your equations, you, you must uh, say if pressure get, goes to zero, below zero, if you are relativistic and you find superluminal velocities. So there are a number of uh, physical uh, restrictions that you impose. If any of those is violated, you will mark the cell as troubled. But then you have also a mathematical prescription, and it's the following. No? If my candidate solution, which I'm checking, is not bounded below by the minimum, the minimum value of the polynomials in my neighboring cells, and is not bounded above by the maximum value of the polynomials of my neighboring cells, then I will say this is a trouble cell because it has oscillated. No, this is a detection for, of oscillations, if you wish. Delta is just uh, to allow some overshooting and undershooting. Of course, I don't want to compute minima and maxima of polynomials, right? I have already a number of problems. I don't want to, to compute minima and maxima of polynomials. So I will just rephrase the, this relation here in terms of cell averages, because I can compare constants much easier. So here I have a, a cell average, which comes from the candidate solution. And I compare that with minima and maxima of cell averages of my neighbors. So in practice, <clears throat> this is the cell that I'm checking. U star, I compute the cell averages. and I compare with the neighbors. 
the Vornoi neighbors, this symbol here stands for Vornoi, are those that share a node with it, that's uh, All right, so this is the criterion. And if you do that, you can build the following prescription. We have our known solution, we evolve in time, we get a candidate solution. It is CFL constrained by the discontinuous Galerkin scheme. All right, so it has uh, the CFL condition that we have explained on Tuesday. And then I check for it. Is it physically admissible and the discrete ma maximum principle fulfilling? If it's yes, then I will promote it to the true solution and the scheme will go on. If it is not, I will do this projection on the subgrid. I will get the cell averages. And here, I will apply a much more robust finite volume scheme. I've written ADAR we know, but it's in general ADAR finite volume. Could be ADAR TVD in the sense that I repeat the same technology of the local space-time discontinuous Galerkin approach, but using as initial condition the polynomial obtained from the cell averages. I will explain this in a while. In any case, this uh, evolution on the subgrid level is regarded to be much more robust because uh, you can even go down to second order TVD if you wish. And then you obtain new cell averages, and then you reconstruct them with a reconstruction operator to recover a DG polynomial on the main grid. All right, looks like complicated, but it's actually not much. Uh, a comment about the choice of the number of cells along in the subgrid. As I said, it must be at least n plus one, because the, this continuous Galerkin uh, polynomial contains n plus one coefficients along each direction. But it is better to choose 2n plus 1, because the two CFL conditions are different for finite volume and discontinuous Galerkin. So if you want to have the matching between the time steps, it's better to have number of cells, which is 2n plus 1. There is also another motivation, which has to do with the error, because it has been proved that for, at least in the linear case, the, the, the higher the CFL, the smaller the error. Huh? This is interesting. The closer you approach CFL1, the smaller the error. So here is the case when you select 2n plus 1 grids along each direction. All right. So that's why here I written maximal local CFL through this choice. Because I've talked a bit about finite volume here, I am performing an either finite volume. I've written Uino because uh, it's a possibility among many of finite volume. So let me spend a few words on how we implement the finite volume. It will be fast, but because we use the same basis expansion, it's very reminiscent of what you've done so far. <clears throat> So a bit about eta finite volume, right? Which incorporates into this limiter. If you want to perform a reconstruction in space starting from cell averages, you have two choices in general. You can do an intrinsic multidimensional reconstruction, just like in this figure, for example. This is even on structure mesh. You want to reconstruct on the black triangle and you have to select a stencil of cells and reconstruct from cell averages of your neighbors a polynomial into the triangle. All right, this can be done. There are many references. It can be done even for Lagrangian schemes. But I don't want to talk about it. I will show you a much simpler dimension by dimension Wiener reconstruction, which works in the following way. Maybe not all of you are familiar with Wiener, so the idea is uh, is the following. WINO stands for Weighted Essentially Non-Oscillatory Schemes. <coughs> we want to reconstruct in the cell I, all right? So depending on the order of the degree of the polynomial, we select a number of cells. Well, M equal one is even trivial. Let's start from M equal two at least. We will use the cell averages of these three stencils. There is a left-handed stencil, a central one and a right-handed. All right. 
So from these uh, leverages, I can reconstruct the polynomial in the way that we show you. And then I will look at this polynomial, and I may either just choose the least oscillatory one. This is called the ENO strategy, essentially non-oscillatory. And so you throw away two of them, you just keep one. Or you can give a weight to each of them, and it is the weighted, essentially non-oscillatory. And so you will, in essentially, make an average of this information and extract just one single polynomial. Depending on the degree, you may have always three, four, three, four, three, four stencils, okay? It's not the same as in the original Jiang and Shu we know, as you can, people who are in the field will appreciate the difference. <coughs> All right, so for any of these stencils, I need to reconstruct a polynomial. I do, I do. W will indicate such a polynomial, okay? The polynomial obtained from cell averages. So such a polynomial, as we are doing all the time, is expanded over, over a basis, again. The nodal basis in one space, for example, is just CP, spatial dependence, degrees of freedom. There is uh, such a polynomial for each stencil. So there is, that's why you see an index S. S for the stencil S. X, because I'm reconstructing along X. And uh, P, because P are the degrees of freedom. Okay? Now, as usual for finite volume methods, the, these reconstructed polynomials must preserve the cell averages. So when you integrate uh, in space here, your polynomial, you want to recover the cell average. This generates a linear system in, in the unknown coefficients, and that's what you need to solve. So you get out these coefficients, but now you want to wait, as I said. We, have, we compute such polynomial for each stencil, and now I have to make a, a combination of them. So the final polynomial here, there is no longer an S index, because it's the final one will be an expansion with expansion coefficients, which are given by a weighting of the coefficients for any stencil. So here there is a, a weight for any stencil S. And if you go to the original paper by Jiang and Shu, you will see how they, they compute such weights, omega S, right, for any stencil. Here is very similar, the, the, the prescription is very similar. There is a normalization, W tilde S is given by this. And you see here there is a number, sigma, which measures the oscillator, oscillation of the polynomial. If it's oscillate much, this number will be small, the weight will be small, and so the contribution of such polynomial to the final one will be negligible. So sigma S is an oscillation indicator that comes from here. It's computed in this form. Okay, and I don't, go, I don't want to go much into the detail, but as you see, it, it is computed from the weights of the, sorry, f from the expansion coefficients of, of each stencil. In practice, for the choice of lambda here, because there are these lambda, lambda on the numerator, you have some freedom. You can choose to give a very large number to the central stencil, 10 to the 5 is what we do, actually and a very small number, uh, one, to the left and the right stencils. Or you may say, well, this is uh, exaggerated. I will, over, uh, will always prefer the central one, but it's not actually true because of, because of this term here, which can become very large, particularly the exponent r is equal to eight, so it's a, it's a practical choice, and actually results do not, uh, are not affected much, actually not affected by this. Right, note that this is a dimension reconstruction along X, but you want to reconstruct everywhere, right? So I'm still an average along Y and Z. I have a polynomial along X, but I'm still an average along the other two. So now I will do a reconstruction along Y and then Z, and, and at the end I will have a multidimensional polynomial. This is very convenient to implement, very efficient, rather than performing such multidimensional uh, Wino reconstruction on unstructured grids. All right, <clears throat> so this is, was all about uh, the uh, we know finite volume reconstruction, and I just recall you, where do I need it? 
I need such a window reconstruction in my limiter because in the limiter I have cases in which I have to go to the subgrid and resolve uh, a finite volume problem there. You may even, as I said, uh, decide to use a TVD second order on the subgrid and be happy. Now there is another issue which can come out because I've described, uh, as I anticipated before, I described a local space of the predictor in conserved variable, right? My polynomial is in conserved variables. Is it this a good choice? Yes, can be, but think about relativistic. In relativistic case, the fluxes cannot be written explicitly in terms of conserved variables, as Charles yesterday stressed. So they can only be written in terms of the primitive. So you have to perform a cons to prim conversion at every Gaussian point. This is bad. <laughs> so we want to avoid such a cons to prim in the, in the space time predictor. And that's why we need, especially for a of finite volume, and I will, you will see why, it might be convenient to develop a space-time discontinuous Galerkin predictor in primitive variables, because there are systems of PDEs, such as a relativistic case, in which the fluxes can only be written in terms of the primitive. And we, don't, and we would like to avoid performing constuprime conversion at each Gaussian Legendre. So we do the following. Now we're talking about the finite volume for the moment. Then we'll tell about the DG. So I am on the subgrid, if you wish. I perform a first spatial window reconstruction of the conserved variable, as I do, usually, in the finite volume context, and I get a polynomial WH, which is in conserved variable. However, the, is the polynomial is defined everywhere, so I can compute it in the cell center, make a single cons to prime conversion, just one for that cell, right? So I will get the corresponding number, and then I will perform a second Wiener reconstruction to obtain a polynomial in primitive variables, right? A polynomial in primitive variables, not in conserved. The price to pay is that you have to perform Wiener twice. First one for the conserved, second one for a primitive, and, uh, but it's a worthwhile doing. In a relativistic case, it certainly is, because you avoid constuprime all the time. Uh, <clears throat> and you also preserve the I order of accuracy because here you are computing an I order polynomial, I mean your polynomial, and, uh, uh, which is I accurate everywhere in space. So once you have this polynomial in primitive variable, you will apply the local space time discontinuous Galerian predictor that I described at the beginning of this lecture using, using sorry, as initial condition um, this pH. So the, the pH here is the initial condition of the local space-time predictor, and we, this will generate a time evolution of it. You have just to rephrase a bit your equations because you see uh, we start from a conservative formulation I write it like this because I'm legitimate to do it. I can also write it in non-conservative form like this. In, in any case, I know that A is the Jacobian, right? So now I will do this uh, here. U is the conserved variable. But I can write here du over dv, dv dt, right? So the u dv is a matrix, and then I multiply on the left by the inverse, and so I get this. So what I mean is that I get a, a PDE in terms of the evolution of the primitive variables, right? Where C is a new matrix, which is given by this. And so this is the PDE that I have to use in my new local space and discontinuous Galerkin for the primitive variables. For the relativistic case, note that V in terms of U, is not analytic, no, of course. The primitive cannot be obtained in closed form. While U, uh, U of V, it is. So the matrix DU over DV here is really the inverse of this, 
I mean, you cannot say that this is dv of the u because you can't compute it. You, you don't have a closed form. So if, you, if you want to see more, you, you will find uh, more information on this. So this can be very efficient in the relativistic case. <coughs> All right. <coughs> Just a comment. I was saying, uh, sorry, that this is, uh, ah, okay. This is for the finite volume case. For the DG case in primitive variable, there is no hope. You have to do a con supreme from your polynomial in conserved variable to the polynomial in primitive variable. <coughs> in that case, you have to do that. All right, then we have uh, another source of uh, uh, a joy, which is combining the AMR with the DG and the subcell limiter. Now we have, uh, according to Jim classification, this is a, the third column in his slide, is a cell-by-cell -cell refinement that we have implemented. So we individually refine each cell, and we apply all these numerical schemes, right? Uh, we have um, this continuous Galerkin on the main cells, and they may generate uh, subgrids. And on top of this, there is AMR. All right, refreshing our minds, because we are doing also finite volume in some cases, we have these uh, needs that if I refine a cell here, le, here the lap, left bottom, this one will need to, for example, to perform a finite volume winner reconstruction. So it needs information from the left. But from the left, there is a, a, grid, a cell on another level. So he does not have information to give. So it has to virtually refine itself. This is standard in AMR. And so we do this by projection, right? <coughs> now, a complication arises if you have the, the subgrid, because it interlinks with the AMR in a way that I describe now in a, in a, in a second. In general, here in our AMR infrastructure, we have this constraint because in order to keep the construction local, we need to have a refinement factor. This is the refinement factor larger than the degree of the polynomial. This comes from our scheme. But okay, it's not bad you know, because if you have a degree of order, uh, okay, it depends on what you want to simulate, but this is our constraint. Okay, so these are the standard operations. Maybe I don't really need to go through it. The projection and the averaging of AMR. But the main comment maybe is the first one on top. The local space and discontinuous Galerkin that is performed locally for each cell uh, is not affected by AMR because AMR, yeah, you, you are at any level of refinement, you just perform your local space and DG. So it's a very attractive feature. You, you don't have to exchange information for that. <clears throat> then the projection, you know, is the, this typical AMR opera operation by which you assign values to the children's cells starting from the mother. And when we do that, we use the predictor again. So here, QH is the predictor, gives number to the virtual cells. The averaging is the other operation. When you have the subgrid, it may be cases when you have to, you have to project uh, on the subgrid. Maybe there is a figure here which explains more than anything else. At least, I, at least it should, but in a previous conference, nobody understood this figure, so <laughs> let's see if, if I can. So in red, there is a cell which has been marked uh, for limiter. So it's trouble cell according to DG, the big one here. But also on the left, the, on another level of refinement, there is a smaller cell in red which has been marked as trouble and it needs the limiter. So here, I gen on the, I'm looking on the right the smaller one, it generates a subgrid with this blue, each of these are subcells, and now I have to perform finite volume we know there, we know TVD, anyway, finite volume. So here, this one in particular, will need data from the left because it has to perform we know but there is no corresponding numbers there because there is a cell on another level. 
So the big one has to project data from the subgrid level one to the subgrid level L plus one. Did you get it? Good. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm joking a bit, but this is the interlink between AMR and uh, the subgrid, which is technically not so smooth to implement, but it can be done. <coughs> and this is in formulas what I've said in words, essentially. This projection and averaging must be performed involving different levels of refinement. So I don't need actually to to explain to you these integral relations. Now we go and see some numerical tests. They are not so challenging, I would say, no? but still they show, in the sense that they are not uh, so physical applications yet, but they are very promising. So I have considered here two sets of equations, classical Euler, relativistic ideal MHD, no, no, not the resistive case. So we know everything about relativistic equations in this form. So I've simply written here in covariant form, a continuity equation, energy momentum equation, Maxwell equations, but just divergence-free condition and induction of the evolution of the magnetic field. For the divergence of B equals zero, as I said, I use this divergence cleaning approach, which is not, is not the best, but is available. It was among the list of Charles yesterday, you know, the second choice. <clears throat> In all cases, I have a simple ideal gas equation of state, so no nuclear matter or fancy stuff. Here is the convergence table that we can extract from a simple, uh, um, is, a, is a smooth solution of the Euler equation, it's a called isentropic vortex problem. And as you see, the discontinuous, the dg from polynomial p equal two up to polynomial eight recovers a very good uh, agreement with the theoretical expectations. If you look at the numbers here, only when you go to very high p, well, a very high p equal eight, it's not bad, you slightly below the predicted one, but the convergence is very well recovered. And, and uh, this is a mm, converging with such order, both in spaces and in time. All right, so if I look at sh uh, the classical Sod and Lux shock tube problems, which are quite standard in the community, I find the following. Here there is DG, the limiter on the subgrid, and AMR. So <clears throat> in red, you see the cells that have been marked by the limiter. So here, there is the shock, and you see that uh, is totally marked. Here, final volume scheme has been active, activated. All the rest, the discontinuous Galerkin scheme was successful. It could compute a solution. This is the <coughs> sod problem, the lux problem is the same. If I focus on, on the detail, you see here there is uh, within uh, two AMR cells, the discontinuity is completely resolved. And this is a, um, the final volume polynomial. Okay, for output reason, then you have, we interpolate on a different grid, but this is a, this is a polynomial that I'm plotting. No, also notice that uh, the contact discontinuity is, not, is, a, is a discontinuity, but it's not being marked by the limiter, right? It's blue because it's a mm, linear degenerate wave. So as it, the solution goes on, the schemes recognizes it as smooth. At the beginning of the evolution, it was red. No? Then it gets unlimited, and it, the discontinuous Galerkin can solve it. Okay, here the same stuff on the on the one D cut. Uh, so it's remarkable, no? because discontinuous Galerkin. Uh, many papers in which you can find problems solving such tests with discontinuous Galerkin. And in the code today, we will see these problems are very similar, but without the limiter. There is no limiter in the code, but it will oscillate. And we will see on smooth solution, we can compute a convergence table. We can do something, something, but there is no limiter. Now, other cases, for example, this one is a two-dimensional Riemann problem. Uh, two levels of refinement, 
This is a polynomial of order five with a simple Rusinov lux. So the Rusinov is the same as uh, local lux, lux Friedrichs. Now there is a single eigenvalue used in the Riemann solver. So it's the easiest of the Riemann solvers that you <coughs> may think of. And again, see, look, this structure here on the bottom especially, uh, at low orders, you, you will see a smooth line. Here you will see these uh, structures with a smooth line. When you go to very high, well, very high, it's a six order computation, you generate all these Kelvin Helmholtz features. We are physical, but of course there is no viscosity, so in principle you can resolve as much as you can. <coughs> it's an ideal fluid, after all. And here the limiting points are very few. Very few cells have been marked for by the limiter. Here more, because here you don't see really, but there is the red. All this shock structure is in red, so the final volume scheme was applied there on the subgrid. Double Mach reflection problem is another standard test in gas dynamics. Okay, here just to highlight, when you go from order three to order nine, solution changes considerably. It's not the same kind of thing that we see. <coughs> As I said, this is for a perfect fluid, right? And the limiter activation, this is to highlight, uh, help people appreciate uh, where the finite volume was uh, invoked. When we go to the relativistic uh, MHD case, ideal, so, so when special relativity, we can solve this Alphen wave, it's a circular polarizer wave. There is an exact solution, it's a very nice test to compute uh, convergence tables. And we, here I stopped at four, uh, but still we, we find uh, a very good agreement with the theoretical expectation of the scheme. <clears throat> right. And here again there are, uh, uh, there are some shock tubes, so maybe, okay, I'm, I can go a bit faster maybe, but I'm closing essentially. Here there are much more waves, so it's, a, it's an MHD problem, so there are two shocks. There's a Fast shocks on the right, fast shock on the left. Then here there is a, a slow shock, contact discontinuity. Here there is an fan wave somewhere, error refraction wave also. But essentially only the shock waves have been marked as uh, troubled. Here is non-uniform detected. You see it's not completely uniform. It may be due to the fact that I have this overshooting parameter and undershooting parameter in the discrete maximum principle. So sometimes it detects in a way that is not perfect. Here there are the 1D profile. Again, uh, it may be, for finite volume community, they may seem uh, uh, quite like standard, but in the DG framework, solving uh, shock tubes in such a precise way is not trivial at all. The rotor problem, we have already encountered this uh, in the resistive case, you remember. <clears throat> Here I have a rotating structure. There is a jump in the density. Uh, the magnetic field is, <coughs> is uniform. And so you have ge the generation of waves coming out from this. <clears throat> oh, the AMR grid and the limiter. So again, here you see quite well the position of the waves. Here there is a maybe a wrong detection of a trouble cell, but it performs quite well. So. This is the last, I think. Is an also tank vortex in MHD sold at order polynomial of degree five. <clears throat> uh, he, this is a, so it's very promising this for turbulence problems you know, because in that case you don't really form, you have very complex structure, so DG is fantastic for that, but shocks are essentially not there. Uh, this is not the case. Here is a very academic test, but uh, the activation of the limiter is very limited in a few places. Right, so five minutes beforehand, <coughs> there is a tutorial session in the afternoon, which is very important if you really want to get uh, the practical idea of it. And we will go through a code which, uh, if, I, if you let me go down at the very beginning, um, we will see how this works. In particular, we will see the local space and predictor, and then the implementation of the corresponding DG scheme. 
So this is important. The way I understand this may risk to remain a bit uh, uh, on the air. Okay, that's it. Uh, thank you.